Hey bag ladies and bag dudes. Today I'm going to be talking about the Minikins challenge for the month of November, an LED sewing machine light. Book review will be for a walk by Jackie Gearing. I'll be demonstrating how to use freezer paper to cut out pattern pieces and there's a great giveaway at the end. I'm Sarah Lawson from Sew Sweetness. Thanks so much for joining me for Social Sunday, my weekly sewing chat. Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining me for Social Sunday, my favorite day of the week. Um, very sadly, I have to send through some condolences. Um, Danny and I usually watch the chat as much as we can before the show starts. And I noticed that Janet lost two friends this week and also Teresa lost a friend this past Wednesday. So um, both Danny and I are sending prayers for strength and courage during this time. I'm so sorry for both of your losses. Um, I see daylight savings time has messed up a little bit with our schedule. So we live in Chicago and our time went back an hour today. And I know that not every area of the country uses daylight savings time. And it got me thinking right before the show, do other areas of the world also use daylight savings time besides parts of the United States? I really didn't know. So I'm really curious if Canada, Australia, Europe, other parts of the world use daylight savings time. Let me know in the comments because I'm confused about uh, what's going on with that. Um, just as a friendly reminder, just about everything that I talk about during Social Sunday are things that I've purchased myself. So these are not things that I'm getting paid to talk to you about, but just cool things that I found that I'd like to share with you. And also everything that I'm scheduled to talk about, I link to in the description. So if you're interested in finding out more about any of the fabrics, notions, books, or projects that I talk about during Social Sunday, just check that link in the description and you can find out more there. So um, just a couple of friendly reminders before I get over to the Notion of the week. Um, the Minikin Season 2 Notions kits are finally in stock, so if you've been waiting for those, I have a link in the description and you can pick up yours now. So as opposed to our kits from last year, this year's Minikin's Notions kits have a lot of hardware, uh, two packs of mesh, there's Velcro, um, three yards of strapping, all sorts of things in the kit. So if you'd like to pick up the kit instead of um, finding each of the elements, if you would like to make all the projects for Minikin Season 2, um, the link's in the description. Also for the month of November, the Minikins challenge for the month of November is the trifle tumbler. So if you've made one in the past year or if you'd like to make one this month before the end of November, the link in, is also in the description for that, and I will be choosing one randomly drawn prize out of all of the people that enter photos in that Minikins challenge, and the prize is for a $100 gift certificate to my shop. So um, it's a great prize, and I, and I hope you'll enter that for the month of November. All right, so my favorite part of the show is extra, extra favorite tonight because uh, it's the notion of the week, and actually Danny got to record his very first uh, non-sewing tutorial, I guess you could say. So um, I'll talk more about that at the end of the video, but Danny shot a video on how to use our new LED sewing machine lights. Uh, it's about a nine minute video, so I hope you'll enjoy. Hey bag ladies and bag dudes, I'm Sarah Lawson from Sew Sweetness, and today my husband Danny is going to show you how to attach this LED light for your sewing machine. So everything that you need is included in this box. So the LED light strip is in here, the power cord, there's also several clips for attaching the cord to your sewing machine. I wanna stress before you begin attaching the LED light to your sewing machine that you make sure that the area that you will be attaching it to is thoroughly cleaned on your machine. You can use a bit of rubbing alcohol on a cotton swab or a paper towel to clean this area first and then please follow the following instructions for attaching the LED light strip to your sewing machine, enjoy. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the light out of the package. I'm gonna put it inside the sewing machine throat area. Once again, I do have the sewing machine on its side, and this is way so you guys get a better angle of seeing what's going on. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna eye up her sewing machine, which I can see it has a ridge down the center of it, if you can see from the side of my finger. And that's the ridge where we're gonna put the light on. Luckily, the screw hole is just off to the side of it. So first thing you wanna do is take your light out, put it in the circle so you can work around there it's not going to be you know fighting with you i'm going to put it to the start of the flat piece of the neck i guess you want to call it i'm going to pinch it down in position so i want to see how long this is going to go on this machine so i know it's going to go there then i'm going to go all the way across here pinch the next corner hold it taut go there 
and I know I have plenty enough room where it does not need to be adjusted so I can use the whole song light. If your throat's not as large as this one, and you're gonna like, well, this is gonna be too big for this. If you look really close to these strips, I'll get a, a different angle, but there's marks that are between two copper circles and there's got scissor marks. You could take your scissors and cut right on that line and you could chop uh, about a one inch increment about that you could chop each piece off. So if you size it up like I just did, you'll see that the size is either right or wrong for you. Generally, it's gonna be fine because it's got a little extra space to go around here. If you do need to cut it, don't worry about it. It's very easy to do. I'll show you later. Okay, so let's peel this off. I guess peeling off is probably the hardest part. Okay, now I got this peeled off. I'm only gonna take a little piece of it off to start with. Because if you take too much off, it may touch somewhere else, get sticky. So I'm gonna start the feed at the very top of the bottom. It's almost opposite. So I'll say the very start of the throat, right in the center part where you wanna get it started. Then as you're lining it up, you can see where it's gonna go. So I'm gonna, it's gonna go right there for this. So I know that's gonna be the position. So I'll hold my finger back here. I'll take this. Peel it back a little bit, and I'll just start feeding this to that same exact position. And as I'm going along, I'm pressing down at every point so there's no gaps. Just feeding it slow. Then you can see the direction where it's going now. So I know I still have it in the middle. So I'm going to feed the next point to the next corner and see where I want it to go. Okay, so right there is going to be the point. So while it's still tight, I'm pushing and peeling at the same time. I'll come back over here. Let me double check, make sure my, it's not gonna go too high. Keep it taut. I'm gonna pull it through and then push down. And then I'll come around this corner here, pull the rest of it off. Well, make sure it's nice and tight in the corner for the other part goes down. We don't want any gaps. Now we're near the end and I'll turn around so you can see it better. All right, now from this angle, I'll tilt it back so you can see. So now I head it off to the side to the front right here, and that's gonna light illuminate the front part of the machine for you. This line here is actually not the middle line, just so you can get for reference. I'll turn it this way, get a little better angle. And that way you got the front part lit up and it's illuminated that you can see in front of you. Also in the box are these little clips, which will help you hide the cabling, cable management clips, what we'll call them. And they have little peel back um, backs. You peel them off and you can stick them wherever you like. What we're going to do is we're going to put them along this bottom here. And it's going to go across the back. So let me tilt this back a little more again for you. So we're going to feed it across here, across the back. So we'll pull one at the bottom. And okay, so I peeled the back off of one. And because it's going to go down and it's going to turn to the back side, I'm going to put the opening towards me. So it's going to also hold it in position. I'm going to put it right below it at the bottom. And you're going to press against it like a three count. One, two, three. Nice and firm. And you just slide the little cable right into that holder. Now if you look, it's in the holder holding it. And that's going to let us feed to the back side over here. You just tuck it to the bottom. And I'll turn it around over here so you can see the back side of it. So now we're coming over here. And we're feeding it right to this channel, which is keeping it nice and tight. Let me put it back here. So the next one's going to be right here in the back, right where my finger's at. And that one is going to hold it nice and taut here, and you won't see any cables going around. Okay, I flipped the machine over to give you a better angle. But once again, it's going around this corner. And it's got, we have a nice channel here. We're lucky enough to have it tuck inside there. So it's going to stop right here at this channel. So we're going to put the next one right at the end here, because that's what's going to hold it in position. So for this one, I'm going to have the opening facing towards the top. So if it slides into it, because when the cable is going to go in, it's going to be pulling downwards. So position is going to be right around this corner, right at the end of my channel right there. One, two, three. Then I'll just clip it right in the channel. And that's it. And you have a fully attached connection. Okay, I flipped it over again so you can get perspective. So now let's attach here. It's nice and taut around this channel. Your sewing machine may be different. So you want to look at your sewing machine first, determine the path that you want to go. And the best way I found was go away from me and we had this channel to use. So you're going to have this cable now and you want to undo this little twist tie. And to attach this to a power source, you could do, you un undo it here and you'll have this little end. Inside the box, you'll have another adapter here. 
It only goes, if you're trying to push it and it's not going correctly, that means you have face in the wrong direction. Just turn around, it's not, it should go in pretty easy, so you're not gonna fight with it. Take it like this, plug it in, and you regularly plug it in the wall. And let's plug in the wall and I'll show you how to adjust the lighting. All right, now we have everything connected. You'll have the power switch over here. To turn it on, you just touch the switch with your finger, right on the power button, and it turns on. To turn it off, you just touch it again, and it turns off. Now if you wanna adjust the brightness, if it's too bright for you, or if it's too dark, you wanna turn it up, if it maybe you had it set previously. All you do is hold your finger over the power button and within a few seconds it starts getting dimmer and it'll go down to pretty much nothing. Once it goes to the lowest point, it'll flip back over and you just let go and you press it again. There we go. And then now it's back to full brightness and you can just touch it, turn on and off. And say if you do like it to leave to the lower setting, so I'll turn it back down. So now it's nice and not too bright and it'll stay at that. So if you turn it on and off, it will stay at that point where you previously set it. I'd also like to emphasize the, por the portion of the strip you're touching over here is directly over the power sign, not the light itself, but the power button itself. That's to turn on and off. You hit the above it, it's not gonna do anything. Below it, it's not gonna do anything either. It needs to be directly on the powers. It's about the, the width of your finger. You can see where it goes pretty good size, but you need to touch that directly. Also, when you're installing this, you wanna make sure your surface is completely clean. So you wanna use like an, an alcohol swab um, and it's really wipe this down so there's no oils or grease because once it sticks, it's stuck really good. And you could press it on, you know, just double check, make sure everything's nice and solid. Okay, so when I have the strip here, if we need to adjust the size, we're gonna cut it. But before we cut it, we make sure all electricity is turned off and unplugged from any outlets. Make sure there's no electricity going through here because you don't wanna be shocked and I don't want no one being hurt. So. Take a word from Danny, do not have it plugged in, please. So if you look at the strip itself, you have one end that's the, the end that's not attached to anything. In between these little copper circles, you can actually see there's a scissor mark and a black line that you can cut on. Let me take a pair of scissors. Of course, these are not Sarah's Good Kai scissors, they're some Scotch ones. They'll do the job just fine. So once we have it here, I'm gonna go right, so we'll cut a, a big portion off so you can see a cut. So I'm going to go to my finger. I'm going to go right to the line itself. Let me see if I can get a focus better on that. So you see them to my, my thumb. There's a little black line between the copper. I'm going to follow that black line exactly and cut through it directly through that line. So I'm going to have to go to the machine and I'm going to plug this back in and show you what it looks like once it's reconnected and shows you it still works. Okay, now that we have it cut and I put it, plugged it back in. And you see this is the piece that was cut off this end here. So let me try and turn it back on. And it works. And so that would be the piece connected. I'm not going to touch it, but there it still works. And you can check the, make sure it still goes down in color, which it does. You can press it again and make it get brighter again. Works like no problems at all. Easy to do. Just make sure it's unplugged from any electricity. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that little tutorial video on how to install the LED light to your sewing machine. I thoroughly enjoyed watching Danny film the video. Um, I can tell he's definitely more comfortable being behind the camera though, but it was really fun for me to be in the other, in the other seat for once. I saw a few questions coming through the comments while we were playing the video regarding uh, free motion quilting. I admit I have not made a quilt or quilted a quilt since I've put the lights on my sewing machine, but I will say that one of the lights, actually I had two of the lights attached to my sewing machine while we were filming all of the Minikins videos. The lights were not on, but they were there. And some of the projects were bigger, like the cooler and the cosmetic bag. And I, I didn't have anything catching on the lights or um, ripping at those, those little clips because there was one clip um, at, on my throat area and then another clip in the back. So um, let me know if you have a similar light, if you've done any free motion with that light on your machine. Because um, like I said, I haven't quilted a quilt since we've had the lights on my machine, but um, I'm assuming everything will be fine. But um, let me know about having like a quilt sandwich in your throat with that light on there. Um, all right. Uh, oh, I saw one more question about the lights that I wanted to address. Um, the lights are $15 plus shipping um, and uh, links in the description if you're interested. Uh, Maggie says, what is the name of that light? Um, we're just calling it an LED sewing machine light. Um, it comes packaged in the little box like you saw and everything's included in that package and there's extra clips in there too. I think we only, Danny only used two clips and it comes with, I think five. Uh, yep, there's five clips in the box. Um, all right, so uh, Danny's favorite part of the show. Um, let us know in the comments right now if you're a bag lady or a bag dude, go ahead and type that in the comments right now. 
super love the bag making community. Thank you for being part of it. I saw early this morning when I got up a photo posted in the Facebook group of a meetup. Uh, 11 bag ladies were at uh, this meetup, so we love seeing photos like that. If you're meeting up with uh, one of the local So Sweetness groups in your state or country, we'd love to see the photo, so please do take at least one photo to post in the Facebook group for us. Um, oh, another item to let you know about. Uh, we had requests for all of the purchased videos in your account on my website to be in alphabetical order, so WebSare has come through again. Um, so now all of the videos and patterns in your account on my website will be in alphabetical order for you. Um, super exciting, especially since now we're adding lots more patterns and videos to the mix, so um, easy to find them now that they're in alphabetical order. Thank you, Web Sarah. All right, uh, the fabric um, that I've added to my stash this week is technically not a fabric, but I had an email about Spoonflower fabrics recently, so I wanted to talk to you some about that. I'm gonna step over to the side camera and show you uh, my little show and tell about Spoonflower. All right, so uh, this is what I got from Spoonflower. Um, this is actually a sampler pack that Spoonflower has up on their website. The sampler pack is $3 plus free shipping in the US. I'm not sure if it's still free shipping internationally. It might be, since I know Spoonflower has other locations. I think they have another location in Germany. Um, but the purpose of the sampler pack is so that you can see the different fabric substrates and reference them as far as color. So what you get in the box, the first thing you get is just an actual piece of cardstock with these rainbow colors. And the purpose of having this is so that you can compare to the brightness or the look of the colors when printed on all of their different substrates. So the substrates that I've used in the past are the basic cotton, which is just your regular quilting cotton. Another one that I wanted to pull out was the Kona cotton. So if you're a quilter, you're probably very familiar with Kona. The, while the Ultra, the basic cotton Ultra is a bit cheaper than the Kona, um, I, and I found this in the past as well, the Kona colors are a bit brighter. So the, the basic cotton colors I found are a bit muted and it looks like that on the swatches as well. Not to say that that's bad, but if you're looking for a bright punch of colors in the design that you're having printed, um, you might wanna go with the Kona instead. Um, I should back up a little bit and tell you if you're not familiar with Spoonflower, you can upload your own designs to Spoonflower. For instance, Colleen, um, a member of our Facebook group, uh, recently had photographs of her parents printed on fabric. So she put those uh, photographs into a, a file, uploaded it to Spoonflower and had that printed out. You can also upload, um, sorry, not upload, you can also order pre-designed fabrics. So there's thousands, probably millions of designs that just people that like to design fabric have already um, uploaded to the website. And you can purchase one of the pre-designed fabrics as well. So I think a couple years ago, I made my mom some Kismet Trinket boxes with Australian Shepherd fabric. Um, I, besides Spoonflower, I wasn't able to find Australian Shepherd fabric anywhere besides on there. So if you're looking for a particular dog breed, breed of cat, um, if you're into, whatever you're into hobby-wise, you can find it on Spoonflower in a design. So there's lots of other fabric choices. There's lots of garment fabrics in the sampler pack as well. Um, I wanted to point out another um, particular fabric that I've used in the past, which is, uh, let me see if I could find it. I think it might be on this side. As you can see, there's tons of fabric samples, not only fabric, but there's also wallpaper. You can have wallpaper, um, gift wrap, wallpaper. There's two different types of wallpaper. So lots of choices. The Minky is super soft and I would love that for maybe a whole cloth baby quilt so you wouldn't have to necessarily quilt it, just have a really cute design printed on there. Fleece, velvet, uh, where's the other one that I've tried before? Um, there's an eco canvas that I've used in a bag which I'll show you in a minute. Linen cotton canvas. Uh, here's the eco canvas. I feel like out of all the fabrics that I've tried from Spoonflower in the past, the Eco Canvas is the most bright. So if you're looking for super bright colors, the Eco Canvas might be what you're looking for. Um, I could go through each of these in individually, but um, suffice to say there's tons of garment fabric. Um, anything you need in a fabric, they've got it at Spoonflower. Okay, so I'm gonna slide back over to the main camera and show you a bag that I made with the Eco Canvas. So 
This is a bag I made for William a few years ago. It's the Tudor bag, and I made it with a, a Doctor Who design that I found on Spoonflower, and this is the Eco Canvas. So he, he still loves using this bag. I think he's had it for three or four years. Um, but as you can see probably from the camera view, the colors are super bright. So um, like I said, I, I like the Eco Canvas. Um, the Kona cotton is also very lovely to work with, and um, I just like having those choices. And if you're looking for, it's got to be like that perfect fabric, or you want to upload your own designs. I'll show you one time, but I made Violet a birthday quilt uh, for her fifth birthday, and I had the background fabric printed on Spoonflower. So I wrote a letter to Violet, typed it on the computer, and my letter to her was the background fabric, which is really cool and really individual. I'll show you that quilt sometime. Um, and there's a funny story attached to that quilt as well, but I'll save that for another day. Um, oh, also I linked to Spoonflower in the description and they're having a sale on Fat Quarters until um, the end of November 8th. So if you're interested in trying out Spoonflower, if you haven't before, if you wanna pick up some fat quarters, which would be really great for making some of the smaller minikins, like the cotton candy pouch. Um, again, that link's in the description and that sale information is on the Spoonflower website. So I have a question for you. Let me know in the comments. Have you ever had custom fabric made before or do you want to, such as the Spoonflower? Spoonflower is also great for having labels printed either for quilts or for your bags. You can print uh, designs and have it printed on either a fat quarter like taking advantage of that sale. Um, you could um, design your own uh, bag labels or quilt labels and have many of those printed and just cut those out yourself when your yardage comes. So let me know in the comments um, if you've ever had custom fabric made or if you'd like to. So uh, William has finally found a hobby. My son William's gonna be 12 next month actually and he's really in big into computer gaming and it's really hard sometimes to tear him away from the screen. Um, years ago he played softball, he played a season of basketball, but lately we haven't been able to get him into any other extracurricular activities. Uh, but he's been doing a lot of skateboarding outside. I know of course now that it's gotten cold in Chicago, but he's asked for skateboard lessons so I was secretly very excited because um, we would never force him into any activities, but I'm glad he found something on his own. and. Um, I started investigating the skateboard lessons, so hopefully we can find something. He wanted to go to the skate park. He asked a few times going to the skate bar park, but I told him, you know, you need to learn how to stop and start and fall safely first uh, before you get up on those ramps. So um, yeah, I'll let you know how the progress on that goes, but I'm really excited to see how it goes with the skateboarding. All right, my book review for this week is a book called Walk. It's written by Jackie Gehring, and um, it's all about free motion quilting, but I picked up some tips that I think might be useful for bag making, especially if you're quilting bags. So I'm gonna step over to the side camera and show you that book review for Walk. Okay, so I did mention um, quilting related to making bags. Here's one of the few bags that I actually machine quilted. This is the filigree uh, double zip pouch and I did just machine quilt very basic lines on this. Uh, I think I made, when did I make this? Earlier this year. I definitely could have used some of the tips in this book that I'm about to show you. So let me pull that out right now. All right, so uh, this is what the book looks like. It's called Walk by Jackie Gehring. And the point of the book is uh, machine quilting with your walking foot. So if you're not familiar with your walking foot, this is what mine looks like. And it basically feeds layers of fabric, especially thicker layers of fabric, evenly through your sewing machine. So it's not just for quilts. Um, especially if you feel like you need some extra reinforcement on your sewing machine. Walking feet can also be used when you're making a bag or sewing with uh, tricky materials like vinyl or leather. So the book walks you through all of the basics, which I really like, and it's a hefty book. It's, how many pages is it? Uh, it's about 150 pages long, so a lot of information is covered in the book, um, starting with the basics, obviously. I paid close attention to the basics when I started reading the book because I thought, and I was right, I thought there might be a lot of help, helpful information um, when working with the walking foot and using it not only for quilts but for bag making. So there's a couple sections on test driving your walking foot just to get used to it. And it talks about um, using markings on your walking foot for quilting or making actual marks, meaning like with a permanent marker on the foot and taking notes in a notebook um, as far as um, how far from the needle to the edge of the foot, um, what that measurement is, um, things like that, turning your foot. 
um, I bookmarked a, a really important spot that I wanted to mention to you, so we'll get to that in a minute. Um, the book also talks about thread to use when using your walking foot and preparing your quilt sandwich. So pressing and starching, there was one point that I wanted to mention straight from the book. Um, Jackie talks about um, she uses starch uh, to make her quilt sandwich, but when she has areas of the quilt that she wants um, especially stabilized, she stabilizes it with stitching. So um, either stitching in the ditch or stitching to the outside of the de design. So the example that was given in the book is this triangle right here. You can probably see the blue lines of stitching in the black uh, fabric that's kind of echoing off the design. She used that to stabilize this design because she was using really heavy machine quilting on the inside and she didn't want to get extra puckers. And so by going ahead and first stitching to the outside of her design, she was able to make sure this area was flat so she could get that really dense stitching on the inside of uh, those triangles, which I thought was, um, to me, a bit mind-blowing, if you will. She talks about marking using Golden Threads paper and a pounce pad, which um, I'll let you investigate through the book, but I also thought that was very valuable information. And um, this part that I book bookmarked with my little violet bookmark, um, starting and stopping, um, which is really easy if you have batting that's uh, several inches um, bigger than your quilt top. But one of the methods that she details in the book, which I thought would be really great, and I'm gonna try it next time I make a bag, the tiny stitch method for securing stitches. So um, she says in the book to use the tiny stitch method, turn the stitch length down to about 0.2 millimeters, which is really tiny, and stitch five tiny stitches. Stop with the needle down and return the stitch length to the desired setting and continue quilting. So that secures your stitches without having any bunched up threads or having threads come loose. So I thought that part was brilliant. and. Um, she references that later in the book too, and she also talks about thread nests. If you have problems with thread nests on the back of your quilt, get into the habit of bringing the bobbin thread to the top of the quilt for every start for either securing method. So either that tiny method or the other methods that she talks about in the book. So that was, to me, was the most mind blowing part of the book. Um, managing large quilts, she talks about how exactly through photographs that she orients them through the, the throat of her sewing machine. And then the rest of the book, which is the bulk of the book, is all of the quilting designs. So Jackie talks about straight line quilting, how exactly to do that, marking it as well as where to start and how to proceed with the quilting. Um, I thought this portion on matchstick quilting was particularly valuable. So matchstick quilting is quilted lines that are about an eighth of an inch away from each other. And she suggests instead of just making those stitching lines an eighth of an inch away, making sort of um, subdivisions. So you can see from these blue lines over here, she quilts much farther apart and then smaller segments with the yellow lines and then finally to the match stick, which um, I like that idea. And she mentions in the book that it reduces puckers by a whole lot. So I'm just gonna briefly flip through other sections of the book. Um, she talks about crosshatch stitching. I mean, so many things that you can use in both your quilts and your bags, radiating lines. There's just a ton and it's very specific. Her, both her quilted um, examples and her diagrams make it um, kind of fuss free and very easy to understand. Gentle curves. I mean, lots of things that you can do with your walking foot, which some of these curves I wouldn't have thought, but it, it looks beautiful. And as you can see, it was all done with a walking foot. Okay, marking, it talks about marking all of these different patterns on your fabric before you start quilting. So again, I, I really enjoyed this book. You can probably tell because I'm going on and on and on about it. But um, again, a very valuable book, um, not only for quilting, but for bag making as well, if you're interested in putting some quilting into your bag designs. Again, the book is called Walk. It's written by Jackie Gehring. And I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed reading this book when I got it. So hope you enjoyed that book review. Um, I have some more book reviews for you for the rest of the year. Lots of new books coming out that I'm really excited about. So I have a question for you. Let me know in the comments. Do you use your walking foot? Have you ever used it before? Um, perhaps your sewing machine came with a walking foot or perhaps you bought one separately. Um, let me know the answer to this question in the comments. Um, do you use your walking foot? All right, so um, there you go. 
Thank you, Danny, very much. Um, my demonstration for tonight came through a couple of emails I got in the past week, week and a half. And especially if I get an, um, more than one email asking about the same topic, I really laser focus and pay attention to that. So um, the question was regarding uh, cutting pattern pieces out from fabric. And the two emails were very similar, but uh, both bag ladies had trouble getting their fabric cut to, um, you know, I'm not an exact person, but they had struggles getting their fabric pieces cut um, to the sizes that they needed to be cut for the pattern. So obviously if you're cutting squares or rectangles, it's easier to do that by the use of a quilting ruler and a rotary cutter with your cutting mat. But I wanted to show you this demonstration on how to use freezer paper for uh, printing out pattern pieces and then using the freezer paper uh, to cut out your fabric pieces. So again, I'm gonna jump over to the side camera and show you how to do that. Okay, so I use this particular freezer paper and there's a link in the description if you're interested in it. Um, it's made by the Gypsy Quilter and it's actually applique freezer paper, but um, obviously I found it handy for bag making. There's 50 sheets in the pack and each sheet is eight and a half by 11, which makes it easy to fit in your printer. Reynolds freezer paper will also work fine for this as well, but I just liked the fact that these were pre-cut pieces that were nice and flat and ready to add into my printer. So one side of the paper is shiny, which I'm not sure if the shine will pick up on camera. Um, the side that is not shiny is the side that you wanna print on. So I went ahead and printed out one of my pattern pieces on obviously the non-shiny side. Here's the shiny side right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and just take my paper scissors and rough cut around this pattern piece. Um, I'm not gonna rough cut around on the fold area. Rough cutting just means you're, you're vaguely cutting it slightly larger. I'm gonna cut maybe a, a quarter of an inch to a half inch larger, um, except the fold area. The fold area I'm gonna cut exactly on the fold. And let me get my iron turned on and going. Okay, so I'm just cutting this a little bit bigger than the pattern piece on the other three sides. And I'll tell you my reason for doing this in just a second. Okay, so my pattern piece is cut out. And because this needs to be cut on the fold, I'm gonna take my fabric here, and I would like this particular shell right here to be in the middle of my pouch. So I'm gonna make sure that that's, that's the piece that's on the fold. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and orient that pattern piece so that the place on the fold area is indeed on the fold. I'm gonna position it in place and then take my iron, uh, my iron set at the cotton setting, and I'm just gonna iron this piece. It's not gonna be a hard stick like you're used to with interfacing when you're fusing interfacing, but the iron is gonna stick the paper to the fabric. Okay, so now I'm gonna take my fabric scissors and I'm gonna cut out my pattern piece just to the outside of the black line, which is what you need to do when you cut out my pattern pieces for my patterns. And because we're cutting out the paper through the paper layers and the fabric layers, which is why I had you rough cut when we first cut out the paper, you're basically cutting this exact. So you can either use this method for also cutting the interfacing out, or you can take your fabric piece that you just cut out and lay it on top of your interfacing and cut it out that way. So the most brilliant part about the freezer paper is that it's reusable. So you can reuse it, reuse it a few times. Um, let me just go ahead and stick it down on the wrong side of my fabric first. By the way, you always wanna fuse it to the wrong side of the fabric. Uh, not that there's any adhesive or anything showing, but just to play it safe. So I can go ahead and iron it again and it's gonna stick again. So you can, you can use this several times. It's great for other things besides pattern pieces, which I've shown you here. It's great for applique and other projects as well, but a very easy and handy way to get your pattern pieces for your projects cut out exact, exact. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that demonstrations, two dem demonstrations tonight, very exciting. Um, it, I'd like to ask you now if you enjoy our sewing videos, um, either our live shows, our sewing tutorials. If you're watching on Facebook, to go ahead and hit the share button right now. Share this video with your other showing friends, sewing friends. Regardless, um, either if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, if you could uh, do us a huge favor and hit the like button, which is a little graphic of a thumbs up. So the, the likes and the shares help us out so much. And also, if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, either of those things, likes, shares, or subscribes, help us out so, so much. So we really appreciate you doing that. So um, 
the giveaway from last week, uh, the giveaway uh, winner was uh, Mirta Flores. So congratulations to you, Mirta. I'll be contacting you via social media for your prize. You won the Minikin Season 2 bundle, um, which was the giveaway prize from last week. So congratulations to you. Um, we have another giveaway at the end of the show, which I'll get to after we have some questions. So if you have a question for me, either a sewing related question, bag making related question, question about uh, a sewing tool, go ahead and ask me in the comments and I'll answer as many questions as I can live. So I saw one at the very, very beginning of the show that I thought uh, I, we didn't want to pass that one by, so I wrote it down. Suzanne was asking um, regarding the 30 and 40 inch handbag zippers that we sell on the website, um, how can you see the zipper color? So if you go to the product listing on my site, um, which is in my shop under the Notions tab, if you scroll down until you find the zippers, the zipper colors can be viewed by clicking, there's little thumbnail photos in the product listing, and there's one thumbnail photo with uh, sort of an online color card of all of the zipper colors. So you can either click on that photo, you can even zoom in on my website to see all of the colors. Um, I'm not sure how many we have right now, but it's quite a bit. I think it's at least around 30 different colors. Um, and they're the By Annie zippers, which have two pulls on them, which is really nice and convenient for some projects uh, like this uh, gloss cosmetic bag. Um, Christine says, would it be possible to add a small pick of each item beside the patterns and videos? There's a lot of patterns and I get confused with so many. Love them all though. Oh, that's a great idea. N didn't even think about that. I'm not sure if it's possible, but um, let me write myself a note right here. Videos, okay. Um, Lois says, will the light work on sergers? That's a really good question. Um, I'm assuming it will uh, because it works on a variety of different styles of sewing machines. Um, I know mine has a huge throat area, but it'll work on sewing machines with thro smaller throats as well. And it should work on the serger, as, uh, serger also. You might just need to clip it shorter like Danny showed in the video since most sergers have this, the really small throat area. That's a really good question though. Janet says, uh, did you get a P.O. box yet? Oh, I totally forgot. Um, we'll try to set that up before, before Tuesday. I mentioned recently on the live show that my birthday is this month, and I would love to collect postcards from around the world. Um, I, you know, normally I'm a good uh, list maker and get to my lists every day, but uh, that's one thing that I haven't gotten to yet, so I'll have to write that down again. <laughs> Susan says, Sarah, if you use Minky to back quilts, do you still have to quilt it up? So. Um, I've made made minky quilts both ways. So we have a few minky quilts in the house where I sort of finish the quilt, uh, the quilt top, the minky was the backing obviously, kind of like a, not a pillowcase, but like just a rectangular um, item sewn right sides together and then I left a hold for turning and then I just top stitched the perimeter. So that's one way to do it if you don't wanna quilt the quilt. I think we have two or three quilts that are made that way. I also have uh, one or two minky quilts. No, I have two minky quilts that I sent out to be long armed. You could also machine quilt those as well. Um, I've heard, I'm not a long armor, but I've heard the suggestion that, especially for minky quilts, um, try, if possible, not to have such a dense design because uh, the more dense quilting designs make the minky quilt more stiff and we kind of wanted our quilts, uh, one of them is Danny's personal quilt to be more soft since they were made with minky quilts. So they do still have elaborate designs, just not so, there's certainly no matchstick quilting in uh, our minky quilts. Sarah says, if you overlap the freezer paper and iron the overlap, you can glue two or more sheets together if you need a larger pattern piece. Great tip, Sarah. Thanks so much for piping up with that. Uh, I didn't even think of that, to be honest, but I do have some of my pattern pieces that uh, you need to tape together. So that's a great way to do that also. Losing my voice here a little bit. Uh, Michelle says, do you have any tips on cutting the clear vinyl? I feel like I, um, I can't get them accurate. Also, does the vinyl uh, stretch when sewing? I feel like my vinyl does. So certainly the thicker the, the clear vinyl that you use, I find that uh, the less stretch there is. The way that I usually cut my clear vinyl is that I lay it on top of my um, gray wool cutting mat so that I can uh, see the table since my table is white in here. So let me, um, this is the gray wool cutting mat that I'm talking about. So I. I always keep the paper on my clear vinyl as long as possible. The paper helps you see things as well since it's clear. Um, and then I just use my quilting ruler to cut the dimensions. Normally I'm cutting a rectangle, so I use my quilting ruler. Um, sometimes my friction pens are not leaving enough markings on the clear vinyl, so sometimes I will admit that I use a ballpoint, ballpoint pen to cut out, uh, to draw my pattern pieces for cutting rectangles. Um, but those are the couple tips that I can give you. Um, the most important is probably using some sort of 
solid colored or dark background so that you can um, see what you're marking and see what you're doing since it's clear. Pamela says, what fabric is the cosmetic bag on the shelf made from? So the one back here is made from Amy Butler fabric. I believe this was the Soulmates fabric line from Amy Butler. Um, the one that I held up at the beginning of the show, the cosmetic bag is actually um, upcoming Tula Pink fabric called Pinkerville. And actually Tula is showing this fabric um, over this weekend. So if you follow Tula Pink on either Instagram or on her other social media like Facebook, you can see some of the fabrics um, in, in real, um, <coughs> excuse me, real life designs. So she's got two huge pillows, which I adore, and I'm actually planning on making those. Um, the quilts you can see that are in her booth. She's got other projects in there as well. So super love the unicorns, and I can't wait till this fabric comes out in March. Um, Beck says, for the day trip in Minikins 2, can a cam snap or two be used rather than the magnetic snap? Um, yes, you can use, um, let me grab my day trip from back here. Uh, this is the pattern that Beck was talking about. Um, this one has a magnetic snap in the flap. You can use a cam snap instead. That would be completely fine. Lisa says, uh, what number Peltex do you use in the desktop stand? Is there only one number or different weights? So the desktop stand, uh, this is it right here. So meant to hold your iPad iPad. Um, I did use fusible Peltex in this particular project. Um, the number for the fusible Peltex, so you want the one-sided fusible, that number is Peltex number 71. Um, the difference is uh, there's also Peltex number 70, which is the sew-in, and Peltex number 72, which is the two-sided fusible. I use the 71 um, in this particular project. Um, they're all basically the same thickness, the three different Peltexes. Um, just those are the three differentiations. I do find though between the sew-in Peltex and the fusible, um, once you fuse the fusible Peltex in place, I do find that it's a little bit more substantial, a tiny bit. I'm not sure if it's because of the melting adhesive, but um, it seems to be a bit more substantial than the sew-in Peltex at least. Um, Jeanette says, what is your go-to interfacing for bags? So I love foam interfacing. Uh, since I just first discovered foam interfacing a few years ago, I love using it in just about every single project. Um, my favorite foam interfacing is by Annie Soft and Stable, which is a sew-in foam. But there's also other brands that make foam interfacings. Bozel makes a foam interfacing called Interform. Bozel has a sew-in foam, one-sided fusible, two-sided fusible. Pellon's version of the foam interfacing is called Flex Foam, and they also have um, sew in flex foam, uh, one sided fusible, two sided fusible. Stay away from the naked flex foam though. Um, the naked flex foam is just the foam without the thin layer of fabric on the top and the bottom, which makes it really, really frustrating to sew with, really, very difficult. Um, what other brands of foam interfacings are there? Um, automotive headliner is another type of just, I guess, generic foam that's not necessarily used for bag making, but um, it certainly can use for making can be used for making bags as well. So those are um, lots of options for foam interfacing these days. Terry says, any tips for sewing faux leather? Had trouble when sewing the Tudor bag. Had to switch to another type of fabric because I couldn't keep it from puckering. So first off, um, my first question would be if you, you were using either a Teflon foot or a walking foot. So I feel that's a must have for sewing with the faux leather. Using a regular sewing machine foot will get it to sort of drag and catch uh, because of the metal foot and that might be, I'm guessing that's the cause of your pucker. So Teflon foot or a walking foot. Harriet says, would you use the heavyweight or regular weight freezer paper? There is a choice and I want to pick the right one. So um, I'm not sure what type this, what thickness this one is or the Reynolds is. Let me check, take a look at it really quick. Um, I don't know, this this ha this one feels like it has a decent weight, so I'm guessing you don't wanna get super thin uh, freezer paper. Yeah, I don't see anything about the thickness on this particular package, to be honest. Um, I do have a lot of quilter friends that recommend, um, recommend the Reynolds freezer wrap as well, freezer paper, sorry. <coughs> Jeanette says, do you have a tutorial on how you cut uh, directional fabric? I do. Um, we did it on our live show on one of our Sunday shows some time ago. Um, it was about fussy cutting fabric. I'm guessing that's what you're thinking of. I don't have the link handy, but um, if you want to email me, I'm happy to direct you to the link on that. Um, I have one on how to cut out directional fabric, um, how I cut it out on the fold. And then I have another video also on fussy cutting if you would like the design of your 
fabric to be continued from your, it's not this way on this particular project, but if you would like, say for instance, the unicorn head to be on the flap and the, the unicorn's body to be continued onto the um, body of your project, um, I have another video for doing that as well. Joanne says, um, if you can loosen the presser foot uh, on the presser foot, that will help. Oh, that's a good suggestion. Joanne's talking about um, the question in regards to sewing with the um, faux leather. Great suggestion. Yeah, whenever sewing with different substrates, I always like to do a little test sew first. So usually you have at least a little scrap of the fabric that you're working with, the exact fabric. Um, I highly recommend before you start sewing on the actual project to test with your thread, um, test your tension, test your presser foot setting because sometimes that changes depending on the fabric that you're working with. Um, re recently I made a grocery bag and um, it was ripstop nylon fabric, it was thin fabric, and I had to adjust both um, the stitch length um, and the tension for that one. So um, different fabrics will call for a little bit of adjusting on your sewing machine. Janet says, are you planning a retreat sometime next year? I do not have any retreats planned for 2019. Um, we're considering moving out of state and I didn't want to leave anything up in the air in case we were moving. We'll consider them in the future, but um, we have no sewing retreats planned for 2019, unfortunately. Um, Quilts by Jenny wanted to know, um, I saw a live video where you showed um, EPP, also known as English Paper Piecing Medallions, and I can't find the video. I would love to join that Facebook group. Can I please get more information from you? So the project that I showed, um, I'll show it again. I know I showed it recently. Let's see if I could get it out here. All right, so this is just one little portion of the quilt that I'm working on. Um, but this is from a sew along called the New Hexaco Hexagon Millifori Quilt Along. And if you just um, Google that or search on Facebook, um, it's kind of a tie-in. It's a free quilt along, but you need the book called The New Hexagon to sew along with the projects because all the templates are in the book. Um, but um, again, that's called The New Hexagon Millifiori, and you can find that on Facebook, and there's also a website a landing page for that sew along. Christine said, Sarah, I don't know how you can say you have a bad memory when you remember all these interfacing numbers and pattern makers and authors and followers. Um, so the important thing, uh, which is sewing, I can usually remember that kind of stuff, but um, remembering what I had for, uh, for dinner the other day or remembering conversations with my family members, I don't remember that kind of stuff as well as the sewing stuff. Mary says, have you tried any of the Lazy Girl So Easy interfacing? So I have some of the Lazy Girl interfacings. I've used some in the past. Um, I feel like they're very high quality. Um, I showed one recently on the show. Um, stiff stuff, uh, which is a lazy girl interfacing that I have here. Um, I find that this is um, really similar to Peltex, which I like using the sew in Peltex for a lot of my projects. So, um, Lazy Girl makes a lot of really inventive patterns. She had some new patterns that she was showing at a trade show this weekend called Quilt Market, and I really liked them. They all have specific uses, like for gifts or gift cards. So, um, Lazy Girl interfacings and um, also patterns they have as well. Dawn says, use a longer stitch length on the faux leather or vinyl. So yes, thank you. This is what I love about our bag making community. Everyone is so willing to be helpful in the comments. So um, thank you for those good suggestions regarding sewing with the faux leather. All right, so let me get myself organized over here. Danny's looking for some more questions. Um, I don't know, Danny, what do you think? All right, he's cutting us off for tonight. So I'm sorry if we didn't get to all of the questions live. Um, you can email me anytime, I'm always available. But let's get away, get on over to this week's giveaway. So this week I wanted to give away three new acrylic templates that we just got in, in the shop. Let me clear some of my mess out of the way. So we just got templates for three of my patterns. Uh, the first one is the Kismet Trinket Boxes, which is um, three different sizes and three different styles of zippered pouches. So we have templates for all three sizes of those, all six actually. Um, we got templates for the airplane bag in regular, which is what this one is, and also size long. And also templates for all three sizes of the Creative Maker Supply Case. So all, all three sets of templates will be included in this week's prize. And to enter this week's giveaway, all you have to do is answer my giveaway question and I'll draw one randomly drawn winner at the end of the day this Saturday, and I'll announce the winner on um, next Sunday's show. Um, just answer my question, and my question is, uh, what is your zodiac sign? So make sure you're logged into either Facebook or YouTube, leave your comments in uh, 
the comment area of either Facebook or YouTube and um, good luck. So my zodiac sign is Sagittarius. My birthday is this month. Um, and uh, yes, so I've had a lot of fun on Social Sunday. I hope you enjoyed yourself as well. We'll see you again next Sunday at 7 p.m. Central Time. Have a great, great week and happy sewing. Bye, everybody. Thank you.